1970, the average age at which children began to watch television regularly was four years, like this cute little girl here. And today, based on research that we've done, it's four months. It's not just how orally they watch, but how much they watch. The typical child before the age of five is watching about four and a half hours of TV a day. That represents as much as 40% of their waking hours. Which brings us to baby Einstein. Now, many of you probably have not seen Baby Einstein, but I will show you a random 20-second clip from Baby Einstein Day on the Farm, and, and here it is. Uh, in that 20-second clip, there were seven scene changes, about one every three seconds. It's about the most exhausting day on the farm since John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. <laughs> and of course, it's nothing like being on a real farm, right? Adults watching this find it discombobulating because your mind is trying to make a coherent narrative out of this, and there is no coherent narrative. It jumps all over the place. But babies aren't trying to make a coherent narrative out of it. They're not capable of doing that. It's all of that screen change, all of that stimulation that's keeping them actually engaged in the screen. So we've had for a while what we call the overstimulation hypothesis, which is that prolonged exposure to this rapid image change during this critical window of brain development would precondition the mind to expect high levels of input. And that would lead to inattention in later life. So you watch enough Baby Einstein day on the farm as a baby, and when you go to a farm as a school-aged child, it's boring. It's too slow. How come there's no sheep suddenly popping into my face? How come there's no marionette going back and forth? Why do I have to walk from here to there? That's the general idea, that you're conditioning the mind to that reality, which doesn't actually exist. This project is teaching two different math concepts. So one concept is supatizing, and that is the ability to recognize a set of numbers just by looking at it and not by counting. So if I hold up two fingers, you say two. Without counting one, two, you just say two. So supatizing is one of the core math concepts. We'll design four games at the end of this project to teach supatizing. The other part of the curriculum that we're teaching is equipartitioning, which is fair sharing, the ability to take a group of objects and divide them equally amongst a set. So this is a really interesting area. Um, a lot of work has been done in this area in early elementary, but not a lot of work has been done in preschool. So we're pioneering this curriculum topic as well as the implementation of it as um, a technology-based project. Perfect. Now, can we check and see if that's right? Yes. Oh, I made it! Look at what you do with the watermelon. Eat it. You eat it? I don't like one. But they do. Look at it. They each have the same. It's equal. They love it. It's equal. It is equal, Gianni. I really know how to cut them. You do know how to cut them? Mommy's teaching you She's teaching you how to cut? Some developers are examining how to create apps that, even if used by children alone, could engage and challenge them. One way to practice early math skills, for example, might involve playing pattern games or matching games integrated with music. Oh, 